Hey guys, Wild Ox Studios here, and today we're going to be going over um, vehicle, the advanced vehicle template for 5.4 preview, specifically um, how to get the template working with split screen. So I will select a folder and we will just give this thing a quick name, vehicle sample and we will go. So we're using 5.4 preview because in previous videos I've mentioned that the there's a setting that has been booked out since 5.1. Um, if you come into your project settings and you look for something called skip, assigning gamepad to player one, this setting hasn't worked since 5.1, but it does work in 5.4 preview, so um, you can use your keyboard and your gamepad and um, you'll be able to test multiple players. If we take a look at the blueprint, blueprints folder, you'll see a couple of different game modes here and you'll see a vehicle advanced pawn with a couple of folders for sports car and off-road car. This project uses inheritance. And what that means is the vehicle advanced game mode is based on the game mode base and then the off-road game mode inherits from this. Um, and all the game modes are really doing is specifying what pawn to spawn. So sports car is a child of this vehicle. All of your casting is gonna go against this and you'll see this in the controller. So if we open the controller up, you'll see it's gonna try to cast against that parent. And what that means is it will pass the cast parameter for both of the child cars because they're both a child of this vehicle pawn, well vehicle pawn. So, Anything we cast to this vehicle advanced game mode on would pass for any child of that class. That's the way that inheritance works. Um, if we open this game mode up, you'll see that there's literally no logic here. So the off-road and the uh, uh, advanced vehicle game mode, all they really are vehicle advanced, should I say, all they're really doing is telling you what, what spawn, uh, pawn the spawn. And if we hit play, you'll see we, we spawn at the player start location. Um, so that's it. That's all it's really doing. Uh, let's get to this location really quickly with our own logic. So first thing I'll say is make note of what this is. And, um, also let's go reset the transform on this thing because I don't like manipulating this when I want to use the transform to tell the vehicle where to spawn. Um, pro tip, we can hold the alt key and duplicate these and then let go and do it again and let go and do it again. So because this is going to be a split screen tutorial, um, we need something to tell it how many players that we want to be in split screen. Um, if you looked at previous videos of mine, you notice I do that in the couch co-op multiplayer template with these input detectors and I literally tell it hey use four detectors and wait for the player to hit start then i transfer the controller to the controlled pawn and the player controller that's going to control the vehicle um in this case we're just using the initial controller and we're detecting how many player starts are going to be in the scene and that'll tell us how many players so let's go ahead and make sure that split screen is enabled. And by default, I think it is going to use split screen for local player controllers. It does. So that's good. Next thing is I want a way of knowing what index I'm on or what player controller I'm dealing with. So I'm gonna go through these player start tags and I'm gonna start at zero and go one, two, three, etc. So that's done. Next thing I'm gonna do is go to world settings and I'm going to get rid of this default pawn class. And when I hit start, nothing's gonna happen. We're not spawning, we're just blank. Um, this is where <laughs> order of operations comes into a play. And what's happening here is the vehicle player controller expects for you to possess something on begin play. That's not good practice we are going to assume that we have a wheeled vehicle pawn for this controller under every circumstance and that means that if we tick anything on the reference um it's going to fail to find the reference so 
this is good behavior if you want to optimize um, performance because you're not going to want to cast on tick. So it's great that they use the event begin play to get a reference. That's awesome. But we can't assume that reference is always going to be valid. You're going to respawn this thing. Um, if it falls off of a map and gets destroyed, it's you want to convert this to a validated get. So, um, yeah, there we go. That'll fix that. Now, if we hit play, we won't get that error message. We're all good to go. Um, so now we will go into this game mode and we will actually add some logic here. So on begin play, we are going to get all of the player controllers. Um, get actors. And I said player controllers, but I meant player starts. We want all the player starts. Um, and if we print it out, say in a for each loop, player start tag, then what you would see in this loop body is that zero, one, two, three. All right? we hit play you would see it come out so that this is good we're, we're getting we're getting somewhere now for each one of these um, we can't convert a name into an integer but what we can do is go to to string and then we can convert that into an int and um, the reason for that is because we're gonna want to create a player for each one of these. Now, the thing that has changed between Unreal Engine 4 and Unreal Engine 5 is Enhanced Input System. And because of an Enhanced Input System, PIE automatically creates the index zero for you. So um, this operates a little bit differently where this would increment the additional player controller after zero. Um, because we wanna control where these players are with this player start tag, um, we're gonna wanna pass this value in. And this is where it gets a little complicated. Um, we also only wanna do that if it's greater than zero, because again, index controller zero already exists. And if it's not greater than zero, then that means it is player controller zero, right? So if that is the case, then what we wanna do is just spawn actor from class, and this is gonna be the sports car. And then we are going to want to get this elements transform. So we're saying, hey, get the player start transform um and we're gonna pass that in and we're gonna do this if it's false and then we are going to possess but the really nice thing is we're also going to do that if it's true so we can just copy these two. Create the player and here's the target. So uh, if we are player one, which is index zero, we're gonna spawn and possess using this. If we're not, then we're gonna create the controller, spawn and possess. Now, um, and we're gonna use this transform on both conditions. Um, the tricky part here, or should I say, the thing that comes along with the mapping context confusion is that, um, and the widget and the ex expectation that this, you know, uh, controlled pawn is going to be here, is that if we fire this on begin play, the controller actually exists before the pawn. 
So that's going to create this race condition where we're trying to do these things before the pawn even exists. So um, if, if you're dealing with an index that's already created and a controller that's already created by the engine before everything else, then that's cool. We know we can, we can trust begin play um, because everything else is going to happen in an order that we can control. So for this portion, I would just say use possess. This way, if you uh, are on possessed, event on possessed, I think. Um, and the reason I'm saying use that instead is because it's able to react to possessing of a pawn. It's not going to fire, do anything until an actual pawn is possessed. Um, and this way, if you're controlling the spawn order or, or respawn order or anything like that on the server or you're doing it within you know the local what i, I would consider a local player uh, our local server for a couch co-op game or split screen game um this is going to be a safer operation and it's also going to take into consideration that um we're not going to expect this pawn to exist until after the possession events fired. So that should be good for that. Yeah, and it is, right? So we got input on controller zero. Let's hit start on this Xbox controller. Looks like everything is good here. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, the other thing you may wanna do too, uh, just a little pro tip. Um, is on this vehicle on the parent vehicle you can come in here i do this because it makes things easier for me to test you can come in here and add a direct button binding um to quit the game if you hit escape um that way if you hit play and you're like okay i'm done testing you can hit escape really quickly and you don't have to like unlock because here's the other thing you're not going to get any input unless you focus this window and the moment you focus the window, it's hard to kind of get back out unless you hit like the windows key or something to come hit the start button. Uh, yeah, stop button. So it's just a little tip there. Other thing is, is that if you do hit play and you want to look around again, you can hit F8 and kind of get around the scene and then hit F8 to get back in. So there, there's that too. Um, Looking at the HUD, I've noticed that there's an event that's firing off, um, likely in the controller, to add something to the viewport. When you're dealing with split screen, you don't want to use viewport unless you want the thing to stretch across the entire screen. Again, in previous videos, Couch Co-op Multiplayer Template, I do have a HUD that stretches across all four split screen windows. But for something like speedometer, you want this to be add to player screen. So we can correct that real quick. And then when we test, you'll see we're no longer using this. We have a speedometer for each one of these now. So there's the one on the right that I'm using with the controller. And then here's the one on the left uh, for player one. So hopefully that gets you guys over any kind of hurdles and talks you through this process of a split screen local multiplayer experience. Um, remember to like and subscribe. And I just wanna say again to the Patreon members, you guys make this possible. Thanks for um, being Patreons in the first place. And second, thanks for asking questions and giving me recommendations to put videos like this together. Um, until the next video guys. Toodles.